This year is the 40th anniversary of the Liverpool 8 uprisings and writing on the wall and Anthony Walker Foundation I've been out talking to activists from that period and community members and we've been talking about lessons and legacies of those events in 1981. Growing up in this area it was quite all, all right until you went outside the area, you were subjected there to be beaten up. That's when it stopped being nice around there. I love this area. There, you know, where I was born. There, I was only born in the next streets. The down here, we used, to, like, we used to get the trams and things and go to the park. And things used to be, used to be all right. But it's when I, when I got a bit older, I started seeing things that I'd ever seen when I was a kid. The uprising happened and the reason we needed a defence committee was that over many years, and Alan's already said, that over many years, um, Granby and Liverpool 8 um, was actually cordoned off uh, by boundary. So if you were black, you couldn't go into town to the dole without having to be chased uh, by groups of white men. You couldn't get, um, go out of the boundaries without the police wanting to know why you were there and being stopped and searched. You couldn't even go onto a uh, Dingle or Park Road. Um, and even in Liverpool 1, for the black people who live there, we couldn't go onto Park Lane. So the whole thing was about defence all the time, but people are individually defending themselves. This was a massive uprising where people got together and said, we've had enough. And it was about, not about, people said, oh, they're against police. We were never against police. We were against bad police. We were against being battered. We were against being abused. Uh, these were young black men and women standing up to white men in uniform. And that was effectively what we were defending against. There's lots of synergies internationally with America and the civil rights movement and South Africa and the apartheid regime um, and Liverpool 8 in particular um, being quite oppressed and having really bad socio-economic conditions such as poor housing, postcode blacklisting, uh, financial poverty uh, where people couldn't get credit, you couldn't get a job if you lived in, in Liverpool 8. Um, you know, the housing conditions were really dire um, and employment opportunities were at absolutely nil um, if you came from this postal code area um, and I think this community has shown its resilience in rallying together um, to address some of those challenges so we've seen initiatives around access to law and education and, and some real improvements we had a law centre on this very avenue that supported our community members um, not only to address some of the problems they were facing with the police um, and other issues because I think it's really important to understand and the relationship with the police which was really really negative at that time uh, you know and I think the 1981 uprisings really highlighted the institutional structural racism uh, not only within the force but right across the city. One of the most significant legacies that came out of the 1981 uprisings was the development of community-led organizations and that came about as a result of taking ownership of the political and intellectual base of Liverpool 8, otherwise it couldn't have happened. The establishment was never involved in many respects in relation to the development of those organisations. Something like 20, 25 organisations came out of that, including uh, initiatives like Toxted Community Radio, Black Links, Liverpool Black Media Group, Charles Wotton, Charles Wotton Nitech, Steve Biko Housing Association, Mary C. Cole House, Liverpool Black Sisters, a whole raft of organisations um, came out of that and they were there for a generation and they impacted in, in the most significant way possible. After the 81 uprisings, black women in Liverpool Ace organised for themselves because it was the first time that we could actually say that we were in part of any structure within Liverpool. Um, our first campaign was around um, women accessing sexual health um, advice and assistance in that. A black woman was raped and um, 
telephoned the right price, the right crisis care line um, for advice and assistance, and was asked what the colour of her paper tracer was. And because he was black, the um, person at the other end of the phone said to her, "Oh well, what do you expect?" So from that, we rolled on to other things. We took over Liverpool Rape Crisis Service at that time. Um, and we got training for black women um, to actually be telephone counsellors. Even prior to the uprisings in 81, there was great initiatives going on within the community. I remember leaving school in 1980, going to the Rialto and joining a dance troupe from, um, from uh, West Africa. You know, it, the group was made up of people from the black diaspora, you could say, from we had people from the Caribbean, from America, from Africa, and they were doing a lot of traditional stuff from the Caribbean, from Africa. And as young black youth growing up in Britain, we gravitated to this kind of thing, you know, and this is prior, you know, pre-riots. So there's a lot of creativity going on within the community already, you know, um, and that's what inspired us to, you know, search for our culture and just have a positive outlook about our lives and the city in general. And you can see from this picture, which I think needs always to be said, that this was about the working class of Liverpool 8, black and white, standing up against a police brutality. You can see how many thousands and thousands of people came out, came out. Uh, and that was involved, that was the source of campaigning yeah. Pat would do well, in the trade union yeah. movement and trades council and wherever to make sure that we all get a thingy together. You can't do anything without allies. That's the blending of different organisations sticking together and fighting together. Yeah. Being in this community you can't be not active, you can't be not involved and you know it's just something that comes natural. I think, you know, lessons to be learned from this period of time in relation to Black Lives Matter and so forth is, is not a direct quote, but to paraphrase um, Angela Davis, is that the victories, we cannot live on the laurels of the victories that we made 20, 30 years ago and still expect to survive off them now. We've got to keep our eyes on the ball, our eyes on the prize, you know what I mean, and keep on fighting and keep, you know, so activism needs to rise again because it's somewhat it hasn't gone but it has faded a bit and it is on the rise again and it needs to to keep that momentum going to be able to not lose not lose sight of what of, 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 of past victories and think we can live off them forever because the fight is endless the forces that we're up against are constantly changing their tactics and and you know we've got to be aware of that so for young people you need to know your history because your history is your roots and your roots is your strength because just like any tree, it must stand with strong roots. So the legacies of 1981 are the regeneration of Liverpool. Without those events, I don't think that what we see today would be here. And sadly, there's been a bittersweet aspect of that as well, because the events of 1981 led to the, led to the gentrification of Liverpool 8 and the dispersal of the community that were so key to those events. So one of the legacies of the uprisings to Liverpool was the total gentrification and redevelopment of our waterfront. If you think about where the Maritime Museum is now and the Tate Gallery, they probably wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for the events that had taken place here in 1981. The establishment of the Merseyside Development Corporation came directly off the back of the 1981 disturbances. I think our young activists today can take a lot from the events of 1981. I think it was a real upsurge of interest in our community off the back of that and it led to a lot of young people becoming activists. I mean, my, me myself, you know, I, my activism comes directly out of that and coming out of the family that was so involved in the events that took place both prior to 1981 and during and after 1981. In Africa, in Ghana, they have a bird called a Sankofa and its head looking at its tail remembering it's past to go forward to the future. So just like Patrick has explained, the youth of today and the people of today, we need to look back at what is being achieved and how we can achieve even more and learn some of the lessons of the past and what is beneficial to our future and prosperity. <laughs>